Kelp Watch is run by two professors. One, Kyle Vetter, a UC Berkeley professor, compared ingesting radioactive materials from Fukushima to air travel. Well, if you ingest it, you got it with you till the end of your life. It turns into a cancer. All your white blood cells are attacking it all the time. It has nothing to do with air travel. It's in you forever. When you get off a plane, you're off a plane. And the other one was by a UC Berkeley professor, Stephen Manley, who announced the California kelp test before they started, the results before they started. And so Radcast then went with this, even though they said they should look for other radioactive isotopes. Kelp Watch ran with it, and they said, we have some questions we'd like to ask the folks who put this study together, that they have been clear on what they're looking for and why. Radcast would prefer their study is open to looking for many other isotopes. When you locate cesium, you can also locate the others because they come together as a package, so to speak. It's not so to speak. They always come together. And the problem was they look for potassium-40, which is natural. They look for thorium. That is natural. They look for barium-7. That is natural. So it's not that they should have been looking for other isotopes only. Why were they looking for insignificant, normal, everyday background like potassium, thorium, and barium? It should have been the first question. And so I'm not going to be very... Uh, easy on any of these people tonight. California researchers embark on Kelp Watch 2014. It's a farce. It's May the 10th, 2014, and Radcast has published their first findings. We'll have a go look at what they got there. I'm just going to jump over to Berkeley's, which is what they linked us over to, and the results from the first sample period. February, March 2014, 26 samples. They got their samples IDs. Um, you can see it's really hard to work with what they got there. And they got a whole lot of fluff here is what they done to us. And so they got the ID, great. And they got the collection date, great. They got the species, which is kelp. They should have put that there somewhere. But anyway, uh, the locations and the latitude and the longitude. And then they started off with K40. Now, K40 is potassium. You get K40, say, in a banana, and if you eat that banana, you off-gas those Beckwell potassium-40. Potassium-40 is in your drinking water. If you drink it, you'll off-gas the same amount of the Beckwells. And so your body regulates it. It's called homeostasis. My dog is sneezing. And... It has nothing to do with what we're talking about, and so they just spent a lot of money doing that for some reason. Let's scroll down, because we need to keep the print big enough to read it. Move over, kind of lose track of what's going on here. So K40, uranium-238 uh, series early, they're talking about weapons testing, and then later, they're talking about now. And 232, thorium. Well, that's an interesting one, because Thorium is also a natural, insignificant, normal, everyday radiation. So they spent a lot of money on that isotope. For some reason, uh, thorium-232 is what we're looking for. And it's interesting they choose those two. Uh, but they also got thorium-232 later. Now, you can see how they've done uranium-238 series early and uranium-238 later. These are... They occur naturally. For some reason, we got them equated with the man-made radioactive isotopes from uh, nuclear meltdowns, nuclear fallout, nuclear weapons testing, nuclear war, which we never hear about, and because they use uranium-238 in bullets, and so they're dirty bombs. But the thorium-232 and uh, thorium early and late stage doesn't make any sense. Who cares? It's like potassium where it's completely irrelevant. It has nothing to do with the nuclear reactors. That never came out of the nuclear reactors. So why are they burning your donations up on that is the big question. It doesn't stop there, unfortunately. Then they burnt up your money on barium-7, of all things. And barium-7 is extraordinarily insignificant as a cosmogenic nuclear and so what that means is it's high energy cosmic rays that interacted with the, you know, just our environment. These, once again, never came from a nuclear reactor. So why are they wasting your money searching for that? 
if it's not to confuse you. And then cesium-137. Now cesium-137 is a man-made radioactive material, but there's 7,400 7, becquerels of it now, according to the EPA, in a cubic meter of water right across North America, yet they can't find any of it. But yet the EPA says it's standard now. It's a normal thing in your drinking water, the cesium. And you can't have any of that, uh, cesium-137, without the 134, but they never found none of that. So how could it travel by itself? Now, you've got to take it into consideration that with the cesium, it would have been 30 times more strontium-90. Cesium goes right into your body, into all your organs, into your muscles, and it affects It goes right to your heart, one of the, the favorite places of it, and it causes strokes and heart attacks, and it doesn't take long. Uh, it's very interesting they don't mention the plutonium because the reactors don't run on uh, barium. Reactors don't run on thorium or potassium-40, right? The reactors are running on plutonium and uranium, and their byproducts are radioactive ionized material. And so why is Kelpwatch and Berkeley and everybody else burning up your money on insignificant normal stuff that don't, didn't come from the reactor, like potassium and thoriums and beriums of all things that come from cosmic ray, cosmic ray. So why is it in this conversation? And why ain't we looking at the real picture of what happened at Fukushima? They don't even put it in the context. There was a tsunami at Fukushima that took out the infrastructure. There was detonations at Unit 1, and this is Unit 1 building. You can see the top is missing, the fuel pool, and the building itself has never been entered and is extremely damaged. This is Unit 2. Unit 2 has a complete meltdown core and a fuel pool. Number 2 also had a detonation. And Unit 3. Unit 3 is 100% meltdown. It's missing its top uh, six stories, and it had detonations. And this is Unit 3 and 4 side by side. Unit 4 also had a detonation. And Unit 3 fireball is what you're looking at. This is Unit 4. There is nothing left there. It's stripped. It's destroyed. It's spread all over uh, Fukushima's site. Look at the damage, the carnage. Think of the carnage from the tsunami from out front. Think about uh, Chernobyl. It was one-third the size of any of the reactors at Fukushima. At Chernobyl, they sent in 600,000 conscripted and a, another 400,000 civilians. It was one-third the size of Fukushima. This is Fukushima's carnage. They can never get them reactors up and running again. The basements are destroyed. They pumped out this extraordinarily radioactive water onto Units 3 and 4. All four of those nuclear plants are hemorrhaging into the environment and the ocean. On April 6, there was a forecast of 2011 showed a radioactive cloud stretching from Texas to Canada. Do you get any idea how huge and massive that is? That was picked up earlier in Canada by Health Canada and there was evidence of sharp features in the Fukushima plume, the plume over southwestern British Columbia. I want you to think about that for a second, those words Fukushima plume over southwestern British Columbia. And why do you think they use that terminology? They did an aerial survey for 18 hours uh, March the 20th, on the 19th and 20th actually, and he flew at 750 feet along the entire coastline of Canada. And what he discovered was massive amounts of radioactive material in updating the entire North America. Right away in June, but it was that first 30 days period or so. A new computer simulation shows how radioactivity is spread around the world. That simulation is based on the scenario in which Contaminated air was vented from the disabled number two reactor building on March 14th, three days after the massive earthquake and tsunami. Computer images show the radioactive material was lifted 5,000 meters into the air. It was then carried by westerly winds and spread over the Pacific Ocean. The images indicate that on the fourth day after the being, being vented, the substances reached the west coast of the United States and on the, on the seventh day, they approached Iceland after crossing the Atlantic. A new On the seventh day, they reached Iceland. Now, 40,000 becquerels of iodine-131 in a single bed of kelp off Southern California 
This most likely was the 45,000, 45 gallon drums radioactive material dumped off that coastline and is directly responsible for all the seals and the sea lions dying off San Francisco because that's where they dumped it. That's what would happen to you if you went out there. The same thing is happening to the seals. But 40 million Beckles of iodine 131, do you think that travels alone? Do you think that there wasn't uranium and plutonium? And by the way, for every iodine-131, every three iodine-131, there's an iodine-129 with a 15 million year half-life. And half-lives are times 10. So iodine-131 is an eight-day half-life times 10 is 80. They lie to you constantly. Yeah, Noah put out a model of a 40-day dispersal. And as you can see now, this dispersal heads right to North America. Think of the jet streams at 100 miles an hour, is 2,400 miles. Think how this stuff is in updating now the continent, uh, Canada, United States. Think about how that's going to rain back down to the shoreline and the coastline. Think how that's going to get in all the rivers and lakes and estuaries. Uh, of course, the EPA has increased cesium 137 levels to 7,400 becquels a cubic meter in your drinking water. In your drinking water! A man-made radioactive isotopes, but Radcast can't find anything. You know, give your head a shake. They're going to show you potassium, just the stupidest, most insignificant particles, and they're not going to look for the stuff I'm showing you right now. Why would you want to give them a nickel? Why would you want to do anything with these people? Why would you not be angry at these people for wasting your money and your time and your energy and your effort and your good fate? It's something you need to ask yourself, because this is not a game. Okay, that forecast showed it was stretching. That was just one of many. Based, remember what that guy said. It was based upon Unit Two, their model. Let me play that again. The simulation shows how radioactivity is spread around the world. That simulation is based on the scenario in which contaminated air was vented from the disabled Number Two reactor building on March 14th, three days. From the Number Two reactor building on March the 14th. Right? And what I showed you just earlier was all of them reactors melted down. I got other videos up here. It helps break it down for you in layman's term. They're not going to do it for you. That's why I'm here. That's why we're here. That's why there's everybody out there trying to give you the information so you can make up your own mind. They're not going to tell you about potassium-40 because that's irrelevant. And so is the other isotopes they wasted your money on. These are not something to worry about. They didn't come from the chain reaction, the three meltdowns, and then uh, number four, fuel pool, is a meltdown detonation. Do you think those rods are not blown out over the place and releasing the x-rays and the neutrons, the gammas, betas, alphas, that you can't even find on Mars, you can't find any other planet in the universe except for Earth. And they're supposed to be locked away because there's nothing on the planet can deal with them. Vancouver, Canada radiation tests showed iodine-131 in rainwater at 100 times above U.S. drinking water limits. Well, drinking water limits, they go by uh, cesium or potassium-40 in the drinking water, which is irrelevant because it's homeostasis. You off-gas it as quick as you ingest it. You can't put any more potassium-40 that's already in your body. And so iodine-131 in rainwater, they never included the strontium or the cesium, once again, plutonium, uranium. It's the, you know, the common ones everybody should be able to look up and find what we're talking about as chain reaction ionized radioactive isotopes. Why, why talk about that stuff when you can talk about potassium-40, I guess? But do you think that all that stuff is going to disappear like the iodine? No, it's not. And they tell you the iodine because they've got an eight-day half-life. They won't tell you about the rest of it because it's got... You know, when you add, get its lifespan, hundreds and tens of thousands and millions and billions for uraniums uh, of lifetime, because it's and it's ionized. It's ionized. It'll give you cancer. Is what I mean by that. I want you to chain reaction. Rain with 20 million particles of radioactive iodine 131 per liter fell in the U.S. during post Fukushima peak. You got to think about that number. That came over with the big plumes. And you're not going to find any of that in your kelp. They're not going to find any of that in their kelp because they're not looking. They found it. They're just not going to tell you. Hot particles bombarded the west coast of U.S. and Canada. Hot particles found at two of the three U.S. monitoring stations during April, including Boston. Remember the fire balloons they sent over from Japan? They never took very long to get there. Just a few days. 
They were found in Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, Arizona, Idaho, Montana, Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Michigan, Iowa, Mexico, and Canada. You know why? Because we got this thing called jet stream. And it brings it over, and that stuff, if it was liquid, it would have washed back down to the coastline. You would have found it in the kelp. Radioactive iodine 131 in Pennsylvania rainwater samples is 3,300% above federal drinking water standards. There is no such thing as a drinking water standard that we knew about, but now they include a 7,400 becquerels of cesium-137 as your drinking water standard per cubic meter. Iodine-131 is a man-made radioactive isotope from a meltdown, from broken fuel rods, or for something like that, from an accident. There's nothing natural about it. It's not supposed to exist. You should have medical treatment the minute you come in contact with it. If you are working on a nuclear power plant and you came in contact with it, you have to get nuclear. You have to get medical treatment. But if it happens to you on the other side, it's no big deal, according to them. Well, it is. 7,600 trillion becquerels of plutonium, 239 released from Fukushima, 23,000 times higher than previously announced. Think about St. Paddy's Day. And think about that ocean. Think about St. Paddy's Day, what you see there every minute, 1,440 minutes a day, coming out of Fukushima and going in that ocean. That's what you got to think about. 1,440 minutes a day, there's one of these going into the ocean. And that guy doesn't disappear for thousands of years. You can't see radiation, see? Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not happening at Fukushima. You've got to think about it. That if it's non-stop coming editor, and it is, you can go verify that yourself easily. It's non-stop coming editor. And so we need to deal with it. We can't just hide away. The political instability of nuclear power. That was February 22nd, uh, 27, 2014. And a lot of lying going on there. But it was interesting they noted, it turns out radioactive plume stretches 4,800 miles across the ocean. 4,800 miles across that ocean because it's hemorrhaging out of there at 300 to 800 tons a day nobody knows exact numbers but at think of it works out to a thousand pound truck a radioactive dye being poured in there every minute a thousand pound truck if you had to 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 manage all of that every every minute you had to get a truck down to the shoreline dump a thousand pounds radioactive dye in that ocean and that went on nonstop 24 hours a day, 1,440 minutes a day, 365 days a year. Then we, you know, it only takes 229 days at a mile per hour, 24 hours in a day, 24 miles. 229 days later, it's on your coastline. 229 days later, it's an endless St. Paddy's Day right behind it. The government models, uh, there was uranium. 234 detected in Hawaii, Southern California, Seattle, April the 9th. Do you think that what I'm talking about is something to do, is fun, is a joke, is is somehow furthering my uh, little agenda that I want to do something and stop this and deal with it, and that this gives people cancers, it's killing the ocean, it's killing our coastlines. They're not going to tell us about it because we can't see it and we're just stupid animals, but we're not you look at the evidence I'm showing you and you tell me, am I lying to you? Am I making any of this up? Am I fabricating it, over-exaggerating it? Of course not. They don't want to tell you it's San Francisco 18,000 times above federal drinking water standards. Do you got any idea what it means, though? Your 7,500 becquerels uh, as a drinking water standard, potassium 40, times 18,000 percent. And, you know, one, two, three... Look at the numbers. It's maddening. But they're telling you now that a radcast that this is not an issue, that this is not a factor, and that the ocean is so big that it can delude a non-stop barrage of this stuff, a non-stop hemorrhaging into that ocean. The only thing equated to is like St. Paddy's Day, because you can't see it, but it's there. It's not a joke. Animals can't live in that. If there was phytoplankton that creates the base, the basis of the food chain and the oxygen, which is what the ocean is full of, was in that river right now, they would all die if that was radioactive dye. You know what I mean? Because you've got to learn about this. You've got to call them out on it. 
Once again, Vancouver, Canada, radiation test showed iodine, 131 in rainwater. Do you think it came by itself? You think the 132 and 133 iodine with that, and that you got a real good dose just from that stuff? Do you think the uranium and plutonium is a joke? Do you think ionized radioactive material is some kind of big, like it's harmless, don't worry about it, donate a bit of money, feel good, and then turn your back and walk away and not hold the people accountable, and put your faith that they done the right thing, because they didn't. They lied, they manipulated, they wasted your money on insignificant, indigenous, normal, everyday, harmless, useless, stupid background radiation instead of looking for the stuff that I'm telling you about. And I got no choice but to come out and try to counter that. I'm not the bad person here. I'm just trying to... I don't want to be doing this. I'm not supposed to be doing this. No one is supposed to have to do this. We, there's a lack of nuclear scientists all of a sudden and we can't get anybody to come out and tell us the truth. And so we're forced to come out and fight back. And we put our money in these resources like Radcast and they stab us in the back. And this 40-day model you're looking at by Noah that they hid away from you, you didn't pay them to do that. You paid them to make the model and show it to you. And every day you got all these institutions publishing all these, ac publishing all these academic journals for around over 4,000 a day, three a minute, academic journals you paid for, and none of them are how to deal with this. And I'm not the bad guy for telling you this, okay? I'm telling you this because we got to have a debate. And we can't have a debate if they're going to just keep putting up these sites, taking your money, and not giving you anything back for it. Once again, you already gave the government all the money they ever wanted. You gave them all the equipment they ever wanted, all the scientists, all the authority they ever wanted. And now you're dependent upon Radcast to go do something. And they just frigged you over. Don't say I didn't tell you. Take care.